Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dustin Hurt, and I'm the director of the ACF uh, Philadelphia chapter. That's American Composers Forum uh, Philadelphia chapter. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Uh, we got a great talk ahead. Um, just a couple brief uh, uh, thank yous. Um, I just want to extend our thank you to the PRISM Quartet, um, who worked with us to put together this event. Um, in case you're not already aware, this event is um, just a hair, uh, ahead of uh, a series of events that PRISM has called uh, PRISM in the Parks. And they have um, a series of concerts um, all over the country, but uh, specifically September 12th to 14th in the Philadelphia area and um, features uh, work by a number of composers, including um, Melissa Aldana and Terrell Stafford, who we have today. Um, so a big thanks to them. Um, today's uh, talk will run about 90 minutes. Uh, there'll be lots of uh, listening and uh, uh, feel free to, at any point to drop questions in the Q&A chat window and uh, we'll probably get a little bit more kind of formal Q&A period towards the end of the event. Um, but yeah, again, thanks for being here. And uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to welcome uh, Melissa Aldana and uh, Terrell Stafford to uh, this artist to artist talk. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Dustin. Hi, Thank you. Melissa. Hi, how are you doing? I'm wonderful, you? Good, everything good, can't complain. Good, good. So, you know, maybe we should, um, I mean, I, I enjoyed hearing um, a few weeks ago, when you spoke to some of the students at Temple, I enjoyed hearing um, a little bit about your background. It was really fascinating to me. And so maybe that would be, you know, a, a good way to start. Mm -hmm. We share our backgrounds and kind of see what we have in common and, and then go, or what we That's don't have in common. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. Um, well, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, I'm from Santiago, Chile. I've been playing saxophone since I was six years old. Uh, my father was my main teacher. My grandfather used to be a saxophone player as well. So I sort of grew up around saxophones at home. And, and he was my main teacher until I turned 18. And then I went to Berkeley. Um, and I went to Berkeley with the idea that I wanted to live in New York at some point. So I remember, you know, I remember getting there and always dreaming about just being able to be here in the city. I get to gain the experience and meet different musicians. And, and yeah, that is basically it to summarize it all. So yeah, so <clears throat> I'm from Miami, Florida, um, and I started to play trumpet in Chicago. Um, and when I started to play, I, I did, you know, my dad went to school with Cannonball and Nat Adderley. Oh, I so didn't know that. He was like a huge, like incredibly huge jazz fan. But because like in the school that I went to, they didn't really have jazz um, I, you know, my decision was to play classical music. I'll never forget, my mom was a trumpet player and she took me to, uh, to the Chicago Symphony to hear this great trumpet player, but his name is Bud Herseth. And Bud Herseth was playing and, and every time he would play just a, a beautiful note or a beautiful passage, she'd lean over to me and she'd go, Terrell, that's the standard, honey. That's the standard. <laughs> so um, I came away with this, this concept of like, what, what, at least she wanted me to sound like. And then, you know, I kept listening to him. And, and so up until I was like 22 or 23, I'd never played jazz before. And then, um, and then when I was like 22, I was almost done with graduate school. And this, this classical trumpet player, Bud Hurst, I actually went to see him and I got to talk to him after the concert. And he says to me, he says, hey, um, what do you want to do with your life, Terrell? I said, I want to be just like you and I want to sit next to you in the Chicago Symphony. He goes, no, nah, no, 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 don't be like me. I want you to be like my favorite trumpet player. And I said, who's that? He goes, his name is Clark Terry. That's who you should be like. Wow. So, so I set up a time, I met Clark Terry and um, Clark Terry says, so what do you want to do? I said, I want to play in an orchestra. He goes, do you play jazz? I said, no, but Mr. Hertz has said that you're a really good jazz player. And he goes, <clears throat> I said, can you teach me how to swing? He goes, I could teach you how to swing in five minutes. I said, five minutes, mm -hmm. you can teach me how to swing? And so in five minutes, he taught me how to swing. He told me to say doodle 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 said that say that over. So I went doodle 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 doodle. He goes, okay, you have the perfect eighth notes in jazz. He goes, now say doodle la doodle la doodle. And he goes, put accent on the law. So I did that. He goes, now you can play anything else. Just plug doodle into it and you can swing. 
But when he was telling me this, he was like eating mashed potatoes and meatloaf and it was all over my shirt. Cause he was like, do la, do la, you know? Mm -hmm. But anyway, that was, that's how I started to play jazz. I, I, I went to Clark Terry and then I started playing for, I was playing jazz for like four or five months. Mm -hmm. I met Bobby Watson and, and then he started to travel. So it's interesting to, to play with Prism because they have, you know, they come from a classical side and they, they come from a jazz side as well. And, you know, yeah. um, it's nice to come back. Kind of, it feels like I'm kind of coming back to my roots, so to speak. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Well, now that you shared that, um, you know, like the way that I started practicing with my dad was just um, just jazz from the beginning. I took like a couple classical lessons, but I never really got into it until lately. Mm -hmm. But my dad was teaching me like my way around the saxophone, uh, you know, all the theory and everything. And then he made me transcribe. And back then I didn't really understand and I didn't really like it, but he made me transcribe Charlie Parker since I was six. And, and we never analyzed it and for, for a couple of years. And also I never wrote it down. And recently I, I understood that like, he was trying to explain what does it mean? You know, what does it mean to swing? What does it mean to have language? Like, what does it mean every single note? All those details, you know? And just to give me a sense of direction from, for when I was actually practicing. So that is definitely like a big, um, like a big part of how I grew up as a musician, just like stealing, learning about the sound and and the time feel and all of those things. So did did your dad did he did he perform a lot as well? Uh, not that much, you know. My dad, uh, he he's a he's a great teacher, mm -hmm. and but like he doesn't have the experience. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And to me. I have, I have a couple of great teachers and I have a lot of like amazing musicians that were my teachers, but they didn't know how to teach much, you know? So I think that having both things is super important, you know, like the experience to transmit that, um, which I, I didn't have it from my dad. I see. So what do you, what was like, like the, I mean, you said you transcribe a lot of Charlie Parker, but what was it, what, what did you, what was the first thing you heard that you were like, oh my God, this is, this is it. This is what, why I want to do. Yeah, well, I, I love it since I was a kid, but I remember I heard Sonny Rollins for the first mm -hmm. time. For the, I don't know why it took so long. I was like 12 and, and I just never took the alto again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was something about his sound and the way that he plays that has a lot of humor um, to me and just something about the sound that to these days, I, I have gone to a lot of periods of transcribing people and then I just can't hear them anymore. But every time I hear Sonny, it's just something about it that reminds me of that child is feeling you know it just I really love it yeah that's yeah. amazing I think I think for me it was like um because when I you know it's funny because like growing up thinking that I was going to be like this classical person when I would hear jazz believe it or not I'd say oh they missed a note oh they cracked a note oh oh no that's you know that's not acceptable and then um and then someone played for me um Clifford Brown playing Donna Lee and it was just like so clean and so perfect that's what got me curious I'm like wow this is this, you know he didn't miss a note it's super clean it's the articulation's crazy so then I started to listen to Clifford Brown mm -hmm. and then I was just my mind was like totally blown and uh and then I you know from him I started to go you know because I read read that he that he was a big fan of Fast Navarro and then I went and I heard Fast Navarro sound I was like oh my god but Clifford hooked me you know it was just like just because he was just, and plus he could, he could say so much in like one course or two courses. Yeah. You know, that's hard, you know, like, like I, that's, that, I would say sometimes I find myself wanting to edit more when I play so that I can, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, Sonny had, Sonny had both, I guess, you know, he could, he could edit what he played, but then he could play for like 20 minutes on one tune. Yeah. And, it, is, keeps, and it keeps getting better and yeah. better and better. <laughs> yeah I went to see Sonny Rollins it was just it was really strange I went to see it years ago in, at a festival in Spain and uh he played this just incredible incredible concert but when he came out he, he looked really frail and he started to mm -hmm. walk across the stage and it was just and he was limping it looked like his hips but the more he played like the more his posture straightened up and the, yeah. and the, the limp went away and then after the concert I couldn't remember how to get back to my dressing room to get my my instrument and I accidentally walked into his dressing room. Oh wow! And I said, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry, Mr. Rollins." He goes, "No, no, no, sit down, sit down." And we started to talk about like Fast Navarro. We started to talk about Booker oh. Little, 
And we just had this incredible conversation about wow. trumpet players. And he asked me who I listened to. And then I was like, well, you know, who would you? And, and it was just, it was amazing. Like hour, I think we sat in his dressing room and spoke. Wow, that's beautiful. I had the, um, I had the chance to talk to him. I was supposed to do an interview, but he was super nice. And he just talked to me for a while. Um, the connection I have with him is through Emilio Lyons. I don't know if you ever hear about him. He's a repairman. Mm -hmm. And to these days, he's very close to me and he's very close to Sonny. So we sort of, he sort of knew about me um, from Emilio. And I remember asking him why he played those long solos, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and he said that like, he just couldn't find what he wanted to say. And he just kept trying and he never got there. So then he was like, okay, whatever, <laughs> you know? And, but yet, I mean, to me, it's just, uh, there is one recording, I think that is live in Norway, it's a bootleg. Um, Studi Heat, they're playing four. Have you heard that? It's like 40 minutes. Okay, I have to send it to you after this. But it's one of those recordings where he just plays and plays and then it's, it's, the way that he does it is so, it's so clever and he never gets old, you know? I think I was, I was thinking about, I was listening to um, maybe like two or three days ago, I was listening to Doxy, mm -hmm. you know, because I was, I was thinking about like, sometimes when I, you know, like when, right when I got on the phone call, you said, Terrell, you look so serious, you know, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I, I think that, uh, you know, there's so much joy and so much humor in music, but I think like when I got on the call, you know, I was, I was rushed, I was panicked, I didn't want to be late and, and I got, a, but you know, I was listening to Doxy and I was just like, wow, you know, he left so much space and he was so patient and, and it yeah. sounds so fun, you know, um, and, and I needed to, I needed to hear that because yeah. some, everything that I just said about what I heard is, is like things that I really want to have in my playing more. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause, cause I think, I think I take myself too seriously. Like, you know, if I miss something, I'm super hard on myself, but, and I think yeah. everybody is, but, but we have to find joy, you know, yeah. in, in what we do. So, you know, he, he brought that joy to me a, a few days ago when I listened to that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I transcribed him for years, years and years. And I never really wanted to analyze each, like what he was playing, because I always felt like I just wanted to try to figure out how he thinks and how he plays, you know? So I just transcribed like hundreds of solos, memorize it. And that told me a lot about space, you know? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. hip and modern, the pa exactly as you say, like having the patience to develop something and being very thoughtful about the story. So I, I want to ask you, Oh, you, sorry. You go first. Uh, do you do you went through like heavy transcription periods when you were younger? I did. So I was, you know, um, so I'd been playing jazz for like three or four months. And when I met Bobby, yeah. Um, what I did is like the person that was, I, I went and studied all the trumpet players that played with Bobby because I thought that um, that's what I, I thought that's what he wanted, you know? So the, 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 the most recent trumpet player that played with him was a guy named Melton Mustafa. So I started to learn his solos. And then before Melton was Roy Hargrove. And then, you know, there were other trumpet players before that. But I mainly focused on like Melton and Roy. And mm -hmm. I never forget, I came to, to, to the gig with Bobby. And I was so proud of myself, Melissa, that like I transcribed these two guys to prepare for the gig. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came to me and he goes, you know what? He goes, I've heard them play and you're not them, but I want you to be you. So um, I stopped transcribing them. And then, you know, the person that before them, I was like transcribing a lot of Clifford, mm -hmm. um, a lot of Freddie Hubbard was like my, that was my everything, you know. Um, <clears throat> I, I say to myself now, um, people ask me like, why do you transcribe? And I say, the reason I transcribe is because I want to know what it feels like to play a great solo, <laughs> you know? Exactly, it, it does feel good. <laughs> yeah, what does it feel like to play a great solo? So yeah, I did, yeah. A, I did a lot of transcribing. I would say now I probably don't do as much transcribing as I did, you know, at a certain period. Um, mm -hmm. because, I mean, I just totally, you know, for, for a while, um, people used to laugh and call me, you know, uh, Freddie Shaw, because I would transcribe a lot of Woody Shaw and like tons of Freddie. But, you know, it got to a point that uh, in all honesty, I, I was playing this, I sat in at this club in, in New York, it was called Bradley's. Mm -hmm. And I sat in with uh, Kenny Barron's trio and there was a guy at the concert. His name is Stanley Crouch, you know, uh, jazz critic. And oh, my God. So I played like a couple courses on a tune or something like that. And he came to me. He goes, oh, yeah. 
He goes, yeah, um, let me ask you a question. I said, yeah. He goes, um, do you know any uh, Freddie Hubbard solos? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. He goes, okay, good. Do you know any Lawrence Armstrong solos? I was like, nope. He goes, do you know any Bubba Miley solos? I was like, nope. He goes, what about um, Rex Stewart? Nope. And he went down this list of trumpet players and I didn't know any of them. And he goes, he goes, you're a phony. And I said, why, why am I a phony? And he goes, because what you've done is you've just listened to the people now, but you haven't done your home back, homework <clears throat> and gone back and yeah. listened to people from the 20s. So I left the club. I was, I was angry and embarrassed because, you know, it, Brad, Bradley's was a small club and there were a lot of people that were around because they knew yeah. that, you know, so they're all. So I left the club and I was so angry and I let my ego get in the way. I went home and I pouted and I was angry. And so two days later, I get a call from John Faddis. He's like, hey, can you come and sub the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra? I said, yeah. And, and so he's like, we'll do these two or three rehearsals and we'll have a concert. And I was like overjoyed. So I go to this rehearsal, I walk in and they take up this chart called Black and Tan Fantasy, it's a Duke Ellington chart. Mm -hmm. So I look at the chart and I'm like, it says at the beginning, it says Pixie and Plunger, which I had, but then it says, it says growl and it had all these markings on it. So I start to play and I didn't know how to growl. I didn't know how to use the plunger. It was so embarrassing. And so went and stops and he says, hey, hey, hey uh, Tara, I said, yes. He goes, hey man, have you transcribed any pops? What about any Roy Eldridge? He, he almost said the same list as Stanley Crouch. And I was like, nope, nope, nope. So <clears throat> from that point on, I went and asked this guy to teach me how to use the, the plunger. Actually, Clark Terry taught me how to use the plunger mm -hmm. properly. But there was another guy that taught me how to growl, you know, mm -hmm. and taught me all the effects around it. And, uh, and that was the beginning for me, like mm -hmm. really having a high respect for the history of my instrument. Because yeah. I think I was just playing catch up, you know, yeah. uh, trying to get up to, to my peers, but I didn't take the time to invest and go back and listen to the music, you know, like, yeah. like I should. And that's what I love about you because, I mean, <clears throat> when, I, when, I, when we talk about transcription, here's what I think is fascinating about you is that like when you play a transcription, like I hear the intent of the artist. I don't hear just the notes. I mean, you capture everything, the intent. But then when you play, it's always you. Oh, I, think, you. I, think, I think that's, that's, that's uh, so beautiful. And here's why I say it. Here's, here's, so when I first heard you, I was like, oh my gosh, what a beautiful sound. What a beautiful style. What beautiful phrasing. But, but, and, you know, like it's so you. I wouldn't have thought, and this, if this isn't a negative thing. I, I, I just thought like you just were born with this original sound. And then when you spoke to the students and you spoke about the level of transcribing that you do, I was like, that's it. You know, like, you know, like a, a great improviser like you is someone that, that's taken the time and it was so refreshing. And the, the clips that you showed, oh my God, I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm your number one fan. <clears throat> no, I mean, you know, um, so when I transcribe somebody, usually my process is like four years. I can be, I'm a, like extremely perfectionist uh, kind of person. So if I'm transcribing Sony, I just do Sony for four years um, until I have nightmares with it, you know? Wow. And, and he usually I spend a lot of time on like learning how he plays melodies too, you know? That is something that I, I talk to my students a lot about this is usually, and I think it's, it's normal when you're younger, like you are more, you know, you want to play some killing solo, whatever it is but then taking the time to learn how to play a melody, like how you start a phrase, how you finish a phrase. And, and I always remember I was playing with, um, what was that, with, with Jimmy Heath and uh, Luta Vakin was on the audience. And this was like maybe six years ago. And he called me, he's like, you sound great, but you have to remember how you start a note on the, what is the first note of your saxophone and how you finish it. And, and that changed the way that I started hearing things, you know, like even with Sonia, I got even deeper into those details. And I feel like to me, that is the main point of transcriptions, you know, like nobody can really teach you what you like or you don't like or, or anything. But usually after those four years, um, it gets to a point where I just know how he will say certain things. I just can feel it. Mm. And then trying to forget about it is really hard. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. really, really hard. Yeah, yeah. I remember you were speaking about um, you were transcribing a, a good amount of Mark Turner. I, 
I love Mark. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, that's enough. I can't, I can't hear anymore. Yeah, I mean, um, I play a concert with him uh, maybe two years ago, and it was so scary because I just know everything that he does. <laughs> you know, I, I really, I, I took a lot of time analyzing. But then, as I, as I grew older, and these past few years, I, I discovered um, Don Bias and Benny Golson. And actually, back in the back 2020, I remember having sessions at home, and I have some musician friends that are very like play very traditional, and then others that play more, you know, maybe more modern or whatever. And I always hear this concept of like, okay, you play bebop, you play like this, or you play super modern. And to me, it's something that I wonder uh, in my playing too, because I'm extremely rooted on the tradition, you know, but uh, it's not what I, the way that I'm hearing things, but I. I analyzed it, a couple of solos for the first time. So I took one by Don Bias, um, mm -hmm. Benny Golson, and then Mark and Sonny. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to see mainly like if I analyzed it, like what is the main difference? So I sort of took like all the middle notes, you know, and just left the sort of like the skeleton, the voice, you know, the voice leading of, of the solos. And it's the same, you know, like the way that it outlined chords, the voice leading, the main melody is just, it's so beautiful, you know, it's just a matter mm -hmm. of like, the approach that you have. Mm -hmm. And and then as I was transcribing, as I was analyzing Benny Golson, I started hearing all these voice leadings that I hear on Mark, but in a much different context. But this was recorded in the early 50s, you know? So I think that um, for me and, and for a lot of young musicians, like we missed that thing, you know, like how hip were the players back then, you know, like even the context is just very different. Mm -hmm. I love, I, I love Benny Golson. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, anytime I would, I mean, this is what's inspiring about you as well. Like if, if you ask, you know, younger saxophonists sometimes, Hey, have you guys really checked out Benny Golson? They were like, well, we know his tunes. Stable Nate. <laughs> yeah. Everybody knows stable, right. But, but they don't really know him as a player. Yeah. Um, and he, I mean, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. um, there's just something about his sound too. Well, like the, the records, like uh, the jazz tech records with, with yeah. him and Farmer. Um, I'm, I mean, you know, trumpet trumpet and, and tenor, of course, have an amazingly long history together, yeah. you know, playing, you know, together. But I just love, that's my favorite sound is is the, the tenor of Benny Golson and the trumpet of Art Farmer. It's, yeah. it's, it's the most, and you know, Curse, um, you know, Curtis Fuller's in there as well. I yeah. just think it's such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sound. And, it uh, is. you know, I, I talked to him maybe four or five months ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he's doing he's doing pretty good. He's really struggling through this this this, this whole time now. Yeah. But he's, he still has his humor. And, uh, you know, I thinking about that, I want to make sure, you know, I said during this during this crazy time, I want to make sure I reach out to all my heroes. So I'm glad I'm speaking to you now. But I need to oh, make sure I, I reach out to Benny Golson and see how he's doing and, and, and all those great artists, because they've influenced us in ways that we, we can never explain to a certain generation. You know what I mean? I mean, to this day, it's like every time I hear Benny, <laughs> Benny Golson live or even Cole, uh, George Coleman, their playing is so hip. It's crazy. It's so crazy. Mo it's more modern than all of us together. So, yeah, it's, it's, we're very lucky to still have some of those people around for sure. Yeah. So do, do you, I mean, I, I know the answer to this question for me, but do you consider yourself uh, a prolific composer? No. <laughs> no. I mean, what do you mean by prolific? Like, just making sure. you know, there's some, there's some people that just um, like write a tune every day, mm. you know, okay. that's just their MO. They, they're going to write something every day, um, maybe sometimes two or three tunes a day. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, from your playing, of course, every, everything that you improvise is, is a composition. But mm -hmm. I, just, I was wondering if, if that's something that you just do every day, like you're transcribing. Yeah, I try to. Um, definitely during last year, I was writing every day, and that's how I wrote the Luna album. But I don't write with the agenda of trying to write a tune, but rather to really understand what I'm hearing, you know? Mm -hmm. And... And a lot of times, like, I find that my creative flow is better if I do it continuously every day, you know, rather than now I need inspiration, I need to write a book. It's like, just write, write. I try to do it. Uh, I usually spend like an hour or 45 minutes, but 
the thing that I spend the most time is practicing and I have a really hard time dividing things. You know, I, I still practice like six to seven hours a day. Mm. Um, so it's like, okay, a little bit of composition um, because it's a way for me to get to know myself too. And I, and also like I, I practice piano every day. And so it's a way for me to also understand better harmony, how it works, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how voice leading works, how it's, you know, all those details. But yeah, I'm, I definitely don't spend nearly as much time as I do with the, with the horn. Well, what, what, what you describe is like 20 times what I do, you know, <clears throat> and I, 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 I asked you that question because I'm like at a point right now, kind of a frustrating point, but it seems like life right now, <clears throat> I thought, you know, I'd have more time for everything because yeah. you know, we've been kind of home, but I've had time for nothing. It seems like now is more busy than yeah. ever. Like, and uh, so as, as far as writing, um, whatever, whatever inspiration you can give, I, uh, I don't consider myself a prolific writer at all. And yeah. I, I would love to, to do what you do, you know, like <clears throat> make sure I sit at, at the piano and, and compose every day, but I don't. I, if I get to the piano, it's because I want to play through something that I have yeah. to prepare, you know what I mean? Which but it's is hard. It, 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 that, I mean, that helps too, you know, but yeah. man, I have not written anything that I would show anyone in like a year or two, you know, especially, yeah. especially since we've been on lockdown, but I've been, you know, as far as practicing, I love to practice. I could practice yeah. the trumpet forever because yeah. there's, you know, there's so much to work on, you know, it, it never <laughs> stops like two, you don't do anything in two hours. That's the thing. No. Like if you want to go deeper into something. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I got to get back you know, maybe, maybe I'll follow your lead and, you know, every day just carve out, you know, X amount of time to say, forget it. You know, I was, what I was yeah. doing at one point, I said, <clears throat> before I could eat breakfast, I had to try to write a tune. Yeah. And so then I stopped eating breakfast you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I still didn't write a tune, you know, yeah. <clears throat> but then, My but, is hard. yeah. So I, I, I'd write now, if I write something or when I was writing more, it was always an inspiration from something, whether it yeah. was a person or what it, whether it was a phrase or, or yeah. you know what I mean? And so I'd, yeah. I'd write from a, a feeling more yeah. than, and so I, I, I guess I got to get back to that and, and find yeah. some feelings to get to. I mean, to me, it's usually, <clears throat> um, I used to do it like that, but then also I found out that that feeling came as I was doing it every day you know mm. and usually like after three days of just doing that <clears throat> like first few days like nothing comes out of my head so I'm just like writing um that's the other thing like I try to not be hard on myself I'm mm. just very accepting of the bad ideas and good it's just whatever it is um but yeah after a couple of days I start getting into a flow and I can write right you know but mm. you know I don't I don't have a family I live alone mm -hmm. um I'm not teaching like I don't you know it's, it's hard to make the time and I, I do find myself very you know spending a lot of time alone you know like also when it comes to you know just like okay I wake up at 10 I'm gonna do I have a, a, a set routine that I try to do every day you know and mm. that's sort of the thing that keeps me inspired but it's a lot of other things that maybe I should be taking the time just to leave or you know to get some inspiration into that you know mm. Mm. it's hard I mean it's hard how do you do it with teaching? I mean, that one of the things that, um, and, and I'm not doing as nearly as much teaching than you, but I find it very overwhelming and, and hard to keep up with, with everything when you're teaching every day. Yeah, it's pretty overwhelming. I mean, you know, now <clears throat> I've, been, I've been at Temple now, this is like my 25th year here. And okay. so when I first started teaching, it was super overwhelming because it was just me teaching like everything. Okay. But now that I've been here so long, I don't, I teach like five or six trumpet students and I, and I run one of the bands, but I'm in charge of the program, you know? Okay. So now my attention has shifted from like, you know, teaching, you know, composition or teaching blah, 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 as opposed to just now only teaching these few things, but yeah. like administrative stuff keeps me up at night, you know, yeah. you know, during this pandemic, you know, or the protocols that that I put in place, if someone gets sick, it's my fault. You know, if, yeah. if this goes wrong, it's my fault. If if this student's not happy, it's my fault. If this faculty's not happy, it's my fault. 
So everything is, you know, I, I, I take, um, I take the weight of it all very seriously. And, and now when I do play music, it's, 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 it's how I can calm myself down, how I can become centered, you know? Yeah. So my practice is now, it's more, my practice is like therapy for me now. I think that for all of us. Yeah. I mean, it gets me away from the computer. It gets me away from, uh, from zoom or from my, from my phone. Oh my God. Yeah. And, and I just have time to focus on something that, that, hopefully heals my spirit and, and that'll transform into someone else's spirit to heal them. <clears throat> but it's, it's really, it's really difficult. You said earlier on, you know, finding a balance is, is yeah. tough. And, and I'm, I'm working on that, like trying to find a balance because I have, in addition to teaching, I have a four year, four year old. So, oh my gosh. She's so cute. She must be so big. <laughs> She's amazing. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, my, to, to, to write, I write on my goal sheet, like one of my goals is to be a great musician. My other goal is to be a great husband. And my other goal is mm. to be a great, you know, father. But then the goal that I was missing is to be a great friend. And, you know, mm. and the way that for me, the way to be a great friend is to make sure that you're always reaching out to people. How you doing? What's going on? And so I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing very well with my goals right now. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But that's what that's what I want to do. And I think if I do that, I think my music will start. I think I'll be more inspired, you know, to, to stop taking so many things so serious and just to have fun with people. Like you said that earlier, just have fun, live life. You know, it's so, yeah. so important to do. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, something that became super important to me last year is relationships, you know, with friends. Mm -hmm. And and I like, you know, like I always wonder where is home. A lot of my friends went back to Chile, you know, and then I was like, New York is home. And then it sort of defined my relationship with my friends. And it's something that has become so important to me. You know, I'm not really good reaching out like everyone, but my close friends uh, have been, you know, just trying to like create beautiful memories with them, you know, with yeah. families. And, and I definitely feel it when I'm I can get into this practice mode where I wake up at six and I'm just like all day in the booth alone and I don't talk to people. And I see the cycle when I'm not engaging with people, when I don't do things that are good, you know, for the heart, mm -hmm. everything starts going, starts getting a little bit dark. Have you, speaking about friends and, and family, have, have you written a, like a, a favorite composition for a friend or a family? Have yeah that you can recall or you want to play? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I don't have it here, but it's, um, it's on the new Blue Note record. Mm. But it's, it's more than a family. It's a, I, have, I started having like dreams last year and I remember them and, and I dreamt that I was a mom, which is something that, you know, like maternity is something that I've been wondering and it has changed a lot this last year. But I, was, I had a dream that I had a baby and her name was Emilia and mm. I was, yeah, Emilia. And I was holding her and I was trying to make her fall asleep. And then I was singing a song. So I woke up and I wrote the song inspired on that, you know. Uh, so it's not a family existing family member, but um, but yeah, that is some things. And yeah, I definitely greeting songs for for mom or just inspirations, feelings towards, you know, family or my own situation. I'll, I'll tell you crazy. <clears throat> so my favorite name when I, I, I had a, a, a kind of similar dream when I was younger to be, I've yeah. always wanted to be a dad, always, yeah. always, always. And when I had a dream, I dreamed of a daughter, right? <clears throat> and uh, the name that I dreamed was Mia. Mm. And so, which is my daughter's name now. So this was years ago that I had this dream. And then when I, uh, when I met my wife now, Jamie, <clears throat> she, she and I, she lives, she's from Canada and we were on the phone and um, she said to me, she goes, would you ever want to have children? I said, absolutely. I said, how about you? She says, absolutely. So um, she goes, what would you name? Would, would you want to have a boy or girl? And I said, oh, a girl. She goes, me too. And I said, well, what would you name your, your girl? And she goes, uh, I, I, I said, well, why don't we text the name that we named to, to each other? And so we were like, okay, we both put send. And the name I sent was Mia. And the name she sent me was Mia. Oh, wow. Yeah, and her favorite middle name is Alma. So my daughter's oh. Mia Alma. Wow, that's a beautiful name. <laughs> so so yeah. Sorry. But it's but it was what's interesting is like years when I when I 
had this dream, I wrote the, a, a tune as well. It, oh, really? Wow. The tune is called Mia. And oh, it's, wow. in, it's in three, four, because of MIA, and it's in, in, the key of, in the key of A. And it was just wow. like, it was like my reflection of my dream. And now my dream has come true. So yours is going to come true, too. I, I don't know about that. You know, like the idea of having family has changed a lot for me this last year. Mm. You know? um, also, I think that's why I was wondering how you handle it with teaching and all the things, because I feel like, like if I want to go like really deep into like, you know, into the instrument, I need so much time, you know, and it's never, and it's never going to end. And I know that I don't want to be the kind of parents that I'm not going to be there. And I, and I have, and I don't know, it just, it, I just don't know how it will work mostly because of practicing. It's not even about career because yeah. you can travel with the kid, but then when, when I, what about when I'm home? Like, when am I going to do my long terms? Like, I don't know, it's a little bit selfish, but it, it made me question like. If you know what, it's not selfish yeah. at all. Um, you know, um, so when we had, when we had Mia, I mean, I, I honestly have to say like, I mean, I get emotional when I talk about it because I didn't have, we didn't have her until I was 50. Yeah. So I'd given up, uh, you know, I'd, I'd been married a couple times. And so I kind of gave up on marriage and relationships. I gave up on ever being a father. I gave up on it all. I said, you know what, if I need to, I'll be a monk and just stay to myself and just practice 24 seven. And then like out of the blue, <clears throat> I met my wife and Everything that practice and all, you know, teaching was totally fine when it was just the two of us. And then when we got pregnant with, with Mia, my fear that I was going to be like the worst musician ever because, you know, how, that she was going to take this time away. And, and the time that Jane was pregnant, I was very like fearful, like my, my, my life and my career was over because I have a child. Oh. But yeah. the, the day I had her, the, I can't say I had her, the day we had her, I was in the hospital with my trumpet and a practice mute, and I played through every lullaby in every key. And it was just, you know, and then I would just improvise these lullabies and the, and, and, and the nurses would come in and the nurses was like, this is amazing. You're, you're, you're playing, but you're also, you know, you're, you're serenading your daughter. You're bringing your daughter into mm -hmm. a world that, that she's gonna understand what you do. So like now when I practice, <clears throat> she'll sit right next to me and, and mm -hmm. she, she wasn't she won't tap me or anything she'll sit next to me and play with she has a little trumpet she may play with that but it's amazing I can't practice like six eight hours like I did when I was younger mm -hmm. but I don't know if I want to you know because yeah. you know I I, I want to maintain and, and grow but I also want to be these other you know I want to yeah. be this good father and it's it's been amazing you know like the things yeah. that I do now, I would never go to a park. Mm -hmm. But now with my daughter, I go to a park and I see her interact with little kids and she's so brave. She like, she, she'll go up to a little and says, hi, can we play? I would never do that, you know? <laughs> I'm like, oh my yeah. God, she's my hero. You know, so <clears throat> it's, been, it's been amazing. And so now, you know, I, I, talk, I do, this, I do this, um, this lecture, this PowerPoint presentation, it's called the, the 21st Century Jazz Musician. And basically, it's like a presentation on time management, you know, because that's like, that's like, for me, that's everything. My time management yeah. is everything. I'm not perfect at it. I do the best I can. But it just, it's just shifted now with, with my yeah. daughter. It's just shifted slightly. Yeah, yeah. that, that sounds good. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, some other experience that has made me change my mind too. But yeah, it's, it's tricky, you know. It's tricky. It's tricky. No joke. Yeah. Yeah. So but, um, beautiful to hear that. Mm -hmm. So I, I got, I saw in your email that you were in Iceland or? I was in Iceland. Yeah. I did a, I went out on a tour with the, with the guys. It was crazy. Um, I went first, I was in Hangburg doing a, a residency and that's basically what paid for the actual tour. You know, like right now it's really hard because, you know, a lot of venues are paying less uh, or doing two sets or doing live streaming. So it's, it's a mess, you know, and then plane tickets, crazy expensive. Um, but anyway, I did the residency and then I met the guys in Cologne. Uh, we did four gigs. Um, 
I, I don't know, I get very emotional when I when I see them because they're really my best friends. You know, like last year I got divorced and I went, I, I was like really low and those three guys were the ones that were holding me the whole time, you know? Mm. Um, talking to Lage for five hours, just like best therapy ever. And and with the other two guys, um, and I, I'm, I can't remember if I told you this, but like last year, I was living alone and then my bass player too and, and Kush too. So we sort of did a bubble, you know? So we were still playing a lot of sessions every wow. week, you know? Playing sessions at mm -hmm. my place. And then we were like, okay, now we're gonna learn these tunes or like maybe transcribe this Sony thing and then just playing. So I never stopped really playing like two, three sessions a, a week. Um, and then we will sit down and listen music, you know? And, and then Kush will cook and so, just thinking about this a year ago and now we're on tour again, it's, it's crazy, you know? And, I, and it made me realize that besides the fact that I really respect those guys and I love playing with them, um, I really love them like family, you know? And there is nothing that can compare to that feeling, being able to work with people that you really appreciate. And, and also people that is like, you know, you have to be very respectful when it comes to the space. Like, I can get super grumpy on the road, like not sleeping, no, this, you know, and I feel like everyone has a really good sense of respect and, you know, it's like, I think that we're a good, a good team together. Um, so anyway, then we play, you know, we play the music. We had to do a COVID test on every country, which was crazy. And then when we were going to London, the COVID test needed to be in English, but it was in German because we were in German and Germany. So we got through security and, and we couldn't, we almost couldn't board the plane because of the language thing. And then somehow we made it, we made it straight to the gig, sound check, tire, no hotel. And then we played the first note and I even got emotional. You know, it gave me good fun when I was like, wow, I really love this. So all these other things make sense, you know? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah that's amazing. Um, so that's I, <clears throat> yeah, I feel very, very lucky. And also, you know, like to me, um, like the idea of having a band is so important, mm. you know, because I like I want to grow as a musician, you know, and I feel like I never really had the experience of somebody older taking me under the wing and being able to have the experience or play with somebody that is like I really look up to, you know, mm. that will sort of uh, guide me through the path. Um, so having the band and playing with, you know, I, I love the guys playing. I feel I feel like they kick my ass every time and they're very they're very rooted on tradition, but very open-minded when it comes to music. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel the freedom to just like get lost and, and play things differently all the time. We change, sadly, we change tunes, we change them. Like, just like as different as we can do it, that's what we're gonna go for. And, and having the, the experience to do that every day with a band, I can feel the growth, you know? And that's what I miss the most. So what about you? <clears throat> that was it was a healing time for you huh yeah i mean i'm still hangover from all those <laughs> from all those things you know like usually um yeah like it's really into natural wine and mm. everyone is a foodie so we we have a couple of those which it's been a while but, nice but it was nice it was very refreshing and also i don't know if you feel like this after the pandemic but i just don't want to do any bullshit you know when it comes to music like i just want to play I just want to play with people that is going to kick my ass and, and not waste time on things that are just superficial, you know? Yeah. I feel the same. I mean, you, that's, you know, that's amazing that you played so much through the pandemic. Like, <clears throat> this is the imbalance of, of, of my life. So last year, you know, I played a concert right before the pandemic with, with my band. And uh, that was kind of the last time I saw my band for a year and a half. Yeah. And a couple of weeks ago, we opened up the Clifford Brown Jazz Festival. And uh, I was emotional, but more than emotional for some reason, I was so nervous. Like, I forgot how to perform, you know? Like, you. there were people there, and I, my hands are shaking. Like, my hands haven't shook in, in years, you know? <clears throat> and I was nervous because I told the guys in the band this. I said, you know, your, your expectation of me a year and a half ago is going to be hope oh, is going to be different now. I'm not the same person or the same player, and I don't have maybe the same security. And they're all like, "Man, I feel exactly the same." Yeah. So you know, we just 
the, the first tune was probably the most awkward. It was like a first date, you know, when you go on a first date, nobody knows what to say. That's how the yeah. first tune felt. Everybody <laughs> felt insecure and awkward. And yeah. then and then as we played, it, it got better and better. <clears throat> but I didn't really play like I practice every day through the pandemic. Yeah. But um I, I didn't play with anyone. I, you know, I did like, you know, people would send me a track and say, hey, can you play over this or can you play? Over this? Yeah. I did that <clears throat> yeah. and I did a whole concert that way. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing that you got to play. With, I didn't get to play with anyone. I think I got to play with people yeah. maybe three or four times in yeah. person for yeah. live streams. <clears throat> um, but then, that lead of lead? oh, sorry. No, then, then like May happened and that was my first gig. And, um, it, it was just by me by myself with the local rhythm section and it was it was great it was like wow I haven't played with people and here's what I got out of it is like you know when you start to get busy and you start to complain that you're so busy and you're not getting any rest you know and oh man I don't want to take this flight oh so early none of that I'm no more no more I'm just going to be thankful for whatever gig or whatever opportunity comes my way yeah, no, I feel, you. Um, you know, like for me, well, first of all, like you have family, so I didn't, I wasn't responsible for anybody else but myself, you know, mm -hmm. and same for the guys, actually one got COVID, we all got COVID and then, you know, we yeah. have to deal with the consequences, but, um, you know, like I got the, I got divorced this year and it was really hard, you know, like I sort of my whole life collapsed, everything that I knew everything you know like I never I'm usually a very positive kind of person mm -hmm. and I definitely have a couple months where I was waking up having a glass of wine going to the couch and just messed up you know yeah. and and I allowed myself to feel like that but then after a couple months I was like I can no you know I, I deny the fact that I'm just gonna get depressed and not play you know and so I I, I started practice I mean I was practicing through the whole time um but then like i moved to Pro to brooklyn where are my friends so a lot of us were actually playing on the park you know so free wow. um and then playing at the house and it was because i didn't want to lose that flow you know it didn't matter how much i practice but the flow of playing with people is like 10 years of practicing in one thing you know yeah and yeah. and that's why i did it and, and to these days, like if I have a tour and then I'm not playing for two weeks, I may play like a couple sections just to have like that, like gain back the security, um, that confidence in my ideas. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, my confidence, I'm still not sure if I have the confidence, but you know, this was hard year for me because um, it's hard to, today is really hard if I have to be honest with you, like mm -hmm. I'm really struggling today. I'll tell you why. And I said, um, <clears throat> so, I, you know, a really close person to me is McCoy Tyner and I played mm -hmm. with him for years and it's been really hard, like losing people and you can't say goodbye. You know what I mean? So like yesterday we found out like my dad has, he has to get, um, bypass surgery, oh, you know, he, 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 and so like they, they just told us that, you know, we can't see him for two weeks because of COVID. He lives in Florida because of yeah. COVID. He's not allowed any guests, any any visitors for yeah. two weeks. And I think he may get the surgery tomorrow. So then, you know, and, and another great friend, um, Jeff Clayton. I played the Clayton brothers with John Clayton. Yeah. And Jeff. We lost him earlier. Yeah. So it's just, it's been a, a really, really hard, you know, year. Yeah. Because you can't get, say goodbye to people that you love. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> I can... I've been married a couple of times. I can totally relate to, you know, after divorce and what that does, you know, I'm a spiritual person, you know, and, 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 and if you read in the Bible, it always talks about how bad divorce is. <clears throat> and as a young person, I would just thought it was bad because it was a, a spiritual no, no, but it's bad because it, it rips a part of who you are out of you. Oh, yeah. That's, that's really you know yeah. kind of what it, it, it signifies and then and then what you have to do is hope that like you're surrounded by enough people that love you that yeah. everything that was ripped can come back you know and that's what your friends are doing you know did for you during this pandemic and I think that's what my friends and, and, and even the guys in my band but that's what my friends have done for me and you know it's so 
important to be around people now that you can trust. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> you know, because man, this crazy world we live in and like all the hatred that has come out, yeah. uh, it's just been mind blowing to me. Just yeah. unbelievable. So yeah, I, I wanna, you know, I'm like you, I wanna surround myself with people that love me, love the music and, and wanna play it at the highest level. Yeah. No BS. I, I'm, I don't have time. I don't have time for it. I just, you know, yeah. and, and you know, um, because of I haven't played that much, I really need to be around people that, you know, because I don't feel like it as secure as I want to, even though as of late, I've been playing, you know, festivals and stuff like that. But, but still, I keep comparing myself to a year and a half ago. And I, I'm, I'm trying to be patient and, and show grace to myself like it's it's okay you know you so <clears throat> this is a this is a this is a hard time in many ways you know yeah i'm i'm sorry so sorry to hear about your dad i can't even imagine you know like i haven't i haven't seen my dad in many years many mm. many years and he had like a heart attack maybe a year ago and you know most like i'm not gonna see him you know mm. if anything happens like my dad still smokes and yeah, so I, I, I totally feel you on that. And it's, um, but you know, um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is that, um, oh no, the, okay, I, I forgot for a second. So the insecurity part, I mean, to me, I'm a very insecure person, like extremely, you know, and and I, as I'm, I, have, I have a lot of like very, you know, honest talks with my friends you know and and I find that when you when I start sharing this or my family show all this like everyone has the same you know and and also I had like a lot of quite a lot of like older students like 50 and 60s that don't have anything to do with music and they wanted to learn how to play saxophone and somehow we became friends and just talking to them they keep saying the same thing just like trying to find the balance you know trying to so it seems like it's a it's, it's something that we're always going to deal with it. But for me, feeling that I'm doing the best I can, um, that sort of makes me feel more confident about the playing, you know? Mm. And I haven't found a way to feel that confidence without the practicing. Mm. You know, as soon as I start practicing, I just feel like, I don't know. I just yeah. feel a little bit lost. Wow. You know? you know, when I hear you, I don't hear anything that you're, you know, like a lack of confidence. I hear so secure and so honest you know that's what I and, and and I I admire I admire that so much you know um and you get around the instrument so incredibly well I remember there was a concert we were playing <clears throat> uh, with Carlos and like you were taking a solo and uh like I looked around at the band and all of us were like like cheering and, you know, so, yeah. and, and when I hear you, I'm like, wow, I want that confidence, you know, because I, I remember on the cruise when you played, you guys played, you and Joe Fromm played that Mark Turner tune. Oh, yeah. And I was like, I didn't even know, like, I was like, I didn't even know they put it on. I'm like, how would I approach this after hearing you guys? There's nothing completely I could ever play on it after oh, the, you, play. I was like, okay. Gerald looked at me, I was like, nope, <laughs> never. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Yeah. So I, you know. I'm, you know, I, to me, it's interesting too, because um, my comp, like, I feel like I'm so ahead when it comes to music, you know, in the sense of really, like really understanding that like, I practice a lot, but I can't control when I'm playing, you know? So I, I wanna be vulnerable. I wanna be, I don't wanna feel comfortable when I'm playing, you know, mm -hmm. and I, and I allow myself to do that. But on the personal side, it's completely different. Mm. you know mm. and and this year for me was a lot about like gaining self-awareness and mm. acceptance towards myself like the things I like and I don't like and be cool with that mm -hmm. and and I do feel like a more sense of um, <clears throat> confidence when I'm playing but it doesn't have to do with like ah, I'm gonna play it's more mm. it has to do with like fuck it this is this yeah. is what it is you yeah. know yeah you know it's interesting because uh um, you know, trumpet is a is an interesting in, interesting instrument in that you know when you meet most trumpet players, they have this this vibrato, this confidence about them, and they're like really loud. And, mm -hmm. and I can't be around that because yeah. um, I'm not sure. Like 
I'm not as confident in my playing, you know, like when I hear you. But then um that's so the, crazy to hear, Terrell. I'm sorry. That is crazy. I mean, to me, you're one of my heroes too, you oh. know, and but it's yeah. really interesting to hear you saying this. Well, it's it's honest. We're you know, we're being honest, but you know what, you know what phrase <clears throat> has helped me as a person? Was well, someone asked me, I, I played a concert one day and they they came up to me and they said, Do you love yourself? It was so deep. I, I mean. I almost lost it. And, and I said, well, well, loving yourself is ego. And they're like, no, it's not. It's acceptance. And I was yeah. like, oh my God. Nice and, so, you know, and so I was like, you know, I just asked, them, I said, how do you love yourself? And they said, well, why don't you make a list of the things that, that, that you think are your, some of your great attributes and then make the list of things that you think aren't some of your great attributes. And then each day, try to change the things that you don't think are great yeah. to the things that you like, or accept the things that you don't think are great. Yeah. And it was so it was so deep. <clears throat> I wish I could apply that. So from that point on, I've been trying to do that as a person, you know, um, yeah. because I want I want I want my daughter to see a side of me that I want. I kind of want to be her hero, and I don't want her to yeah. see all of my weaknesses, you know. Even though yeah. she accepts them. <clears throat> But, you know, I want, I want that to come out like in my playing too. You know, I, I think, yeah. I, I think I, I play, I play for my, my, one of my attributes, I think when I play is that I play from my heart, but, you know, I want, I want to gain like the knowledge that you have because you put a lot of time, you know, oh, and, you too. <laughs> I put a lot of time. Yeah. But, you know, I heard you play those transcriptions. Hey. I, I was like, Oh my God. Like it's so, they were so perfect. You know, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, only thing I can do is perfect is your transcriptions is eat. I'm a very <laughs> good eater. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, when I, when I think about, uh, uh, when I think about transcriptions, it's like, I love the process, you know, like that for me is that like, I love when somebody gives me something super hard and it's taking me like 20 hours to decode it and like, you know, one by one. I love that. Uh, and I try to have that in my in my practice so I can stay motivated because if I'm just practicing long terms and then it's just hard to see how much you improve, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of like an addiction in a way. Yeah. That's a good addiction though, Melissa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but the thing that you were saying about um, self-love, I think that like, I don't know how it's for you, but it feels like every time I move a little bit forward and I understand myself more, I learn some other things and I'm like going back again, you know? So it's like an everyday thing. Do you, to do me. you find that with your playing though too? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. but I'm not, yeah, but I'm not really, I'm not really hard on my, I mean, yes, actually I'm lying. I'm very hard on myself, you know, because uh yeah if I don't do certain hours like sometimes I'm tired and I still practice like I'm I need to learn how to be more compassionate with myself and yeah. you, know. you know what I started to do that's been I don't know I mean this may not have anything to do with music but <clears throat> I've just been um through the pandemic you know I wanted to try to practice other things and to get better at other things and and then um I wanted to you know I love to cook oh yeah I love do you like to cook I love cooking too. Oh, yeah. Melissa. I learned how to do sourdough. Do you know how to do sourdough? I don't. Okay. I'm going to bring you the starter when I see you next time. Please, please. <laughs> the best thing ever. <laughs> I love to cook, right? So through this pandemic, that was, that's been my saving grace. Like, mm -hmm. I, and I've equated it to my playing. Like, you know, I'm kind of a creature habit. So I would find recipes and I would make recipes and and then after I make it and I would, I would sit down to eat, I enjoyed it. And I was like, why can't you be like this when you play? Why can't you eat, 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 which, you know, learn, 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 and then just sit down and enjoy it. You know, go, just go ahead and play. Why is it when I pick up my trumpet and I'm like, oh my God, oh, come on. I don't say that when I, when I eat a meal or I, I'm yeah. sure I won't say that when I try your sourdough bread, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, man, this is good. So I, I think like, my mantra right now has been the two words is like empathy and grace. 
you know, yeah. that's what we all need right now because, you know, the empathy part is just to, to, to be able to understand what everyone's going through. Like when you shared, and I appreciate you sharing, you know, your honesty about how hard it was and waking up with a glass of wine. I have been there. Oh yeah. I think that all of us went there like well, at some moment. It, it, one of my divorces, I remember doing that in my car because I had to live in my car for like okay. two months, you know? Oh, wow. So, so life just has a way of, of humbling us and making us look back and appreciate things. So that's, that's what I want. I want to just keep remembering the beautiful things that have happened in my past, the not so beautiful things that have happened in my past and, and remember the beautiful things that are here in present and continuing yeah. those beautiful things, you know? You know, like one, um, one I don't know, like the, 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 the personal thing and the music to me now is, I understand the connection, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's very deeply and maybe last year I didn't really understand it as much as I do now. Uh, but, you know, like I'm 32 and I, I had crisis before, but I never had a crisis like last year, you know, where I'm entering adulthood, I'm getting divorced, you know, the, the idea of my turn, it was just a mess. And, and I think that it's okay to be, to allow yourself to be super out because that is how you grow up and learn yeah. from the experiences, you know, and to me, I, I, I saw myself just running, running from like my family's issue, my, like how I feel, what I want, just like practicing and then like running, running yeah. until it got to a point where my body was like, you can't run anymore. Like you need to really deal with this profoundly right now. Yeah. And, and now I'm in a place where I, I feel really good. You know, like I just, um, I just got a place. I live alone. I have my whisper. Like I have, I have, I have set up my life in the way that I want it, you know, and I feel very happy. And I think that if I didn't go through that and had that crisis, I wouldn't be here right now. Yeah. And, and to me, when I think about music is the same thing, you know, um, like in order to learn something, you need to allow yourself to collapse, you know, and be completely lost. If not, there is not much of a purpose, you know, for a change or trying to figure out your own things. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, still, I mean, I still have the fear of, of being vulnerable or being sad or going there again, but I know it's very important in order to grow, you know, yeah. and it's very connected to music, I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll keep growing. They, they just posted for us to play some listening stuff. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I could actually share something first if you want. Um, and just, just to make a point to the people that is watching us, I was talking about transcriptions and 2017 was the last time I was like super deep into Sunny. And, and this video is a good representation of what I'm trying to aim for when I transcribe, you know, where it's like not trying to play like Sonny, but like the idea of how Sonny would play some things, you know? So I could share that or you can share something first, whatever. No, I would love to see that. Okay. I don't have anything that deep to share. I don't have anything that I thought of this that explains sort of what we've been talking about. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know if I showed you this before, Terrell, on the class that we did. Maybe not. Too. Yeah, so just to find to the people a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so I was transcribing Sony for four years, didn't analyze it. And then it got to a point where I just know how he plays, you know. And I think about the important things about Sony, which is a space, you know, um, developing a phrase, just taking different directions, going back to the melody, all those elements, you know, that it becomes clear to me after just hearing it like once and once and once and once again. So anyway, this is um, without a song. Thank you. 
Anyway, um, I wanted to share this because it's, I think it's the best example that I can show um, trying to explain what is my own process when it comes to transcriptions, you know? It's trying to figure out how he thinks, you know? Trying to transcribe the spaces, um, everything. I think that you're muted, uh, Taro. Thank you. Yeah. Well, wow, that was amazing. Yeah, thank you. Could you hear me screaming? No, you were muted. <laughs> Uh, so can I play um, something? I don't want to be selfish, but um, uh, since my dad is not doing so great, I wrote a tune from him. So like I said, like for me in my writing, I very much, um, I very much write to, let me see if I can find it. For some reason I don't see it. Um, I very much write to like people and to scenarios. And I'm trying to find this song and it's not letting me find it, but give me one sec that I want to play. If I can't find it, I'm going to do it. Okay. All right. So let me do this. So I wrote this for my dad <clears throat> and because of, so my dad, when, when I told him that I did want to play jazz, right? Um, I mean, it was like, it was like telling, it was like saying that I just won a million dollars. That's what it was like when I said it to him. And, you know, it was, he was almost as happy when I said I was going to play jazz as when I said we were going to have a child, you know, because okay. that's what he's always wanted for me. He's always wanted for me to, to play jazz all my life. And, um, and he loves the blues. So, you know, growing up in our house, I mean, we listened to a lot of, you know, like, pop and soul uh, a, a lot of gospel you know even to this day you know um you know when I was younger we used to go to church like eight days a week and listen to a whole lot of gospel music so I wrote a tune for him and I'll share it. it's called blues for JT and um 
yeah, I, you know, I did it at a, a, a live recording date and the, the recording date, the, the name of the record is called Taking Chances. And I did it because I was sick of, um, I was sick of living life so safe. Mm -hmm. And I was sick of playing so safe, not to say that that's changed, but I was just, I was just at a point that I was like, I like, I need to take a chance. I need to believe in myself. I need to believe in humanity. I need to um, be thankful for where I came from because, you know, yeah. with our friends and especially our parents, I went through a rebellious time and, and I just wanted to be thankful. So um, I'm going to grab this, play this for you. Nice cover too. <laughs> Thanks.
I love it. What a beautiful sound. Oh. It's so beautiful. What year is this uh, album? Uh, that's a good question, Melissa. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> but you know, that night that, that we recorded this, like <clears throat> we, we had three nights and, uh, and my parents surprised me and they came in. And the night that they came in, I was just so happy that that was the night that everything ended up coming from um, yeah. that one night. So, you know. That is beautiful. I, have to t I haven't heard the record, so I have to have some homework. Oh, man. But well, actually, yeah. huh? go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I just, I know that we have to finish soon, but I have a, I have a question for you, if it's yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and I asked this to all my heroes. I remember asking this to Sonny actually, but I'm curious about you. Um, how has your practicing and relationship with music has changed through the years? Um, you know, it's changed through the years because, <clears throat> you know, coming from a, a classical background, my, uh, my practice is very much very routine and just, you know, very, very methodical because I, you know, mm -hmm. I was working on excerpts and I was working on concertos and I was doing all this yeah. stuff. And I don't, I'm not sure when I was doing all that, if I had a purpose, I just wanted to be a really strong trumpet player. Yeah. But the way things have changed is that um, when I listen to people play, like when you were just playing and how you were able to be really creative, um, but the melody the foundation was still there. Um, and I think when I switched to jazz, I was all about like um, technique. I was all about technique. And I think what's just, what has changed now is that I've grown an affinity to melody. That's what I love now. That's the biggest thing. So yeah. when I practice, um, I want to practice things that are more melodic. Like there's a, mm -hmm. you know, there's a beautiful A2 book for trumpet called the Charlier. And uh, there's an A2 number two that is just so beautiful. Um, and so that's part of my routine. In the midst of me working on all technique and stuff like that, I want to make sure I incorporate some beauty. And so, you know, I, I want to do that too. When I, when I, when I practice a tune, uh, when I'm shedding on a tune, I, I want to do, I can't do it on the level that you just did it on without a song. But I always want to find a way to keep the melody is part of who I am and it's part yeah. of what I do. Because uh, of the big thing that's changed about me, I think, is that, you know, I'm really into greeting and salutations. Like I've been really studying how people start their solos and how people end their solos, because it's just like, you know, when I met you, you know, I knew you, I just knew you as a warm, beautiful spirit. And that was my first impression of you. And, I, and I've been really working on making that first impression when I play my trumpet, you know, and, and I want to get my greeting from what came before me because that's going to make me grow. And I want to leave a salutation that's reflective of, of how I want to end. That'll give someone else an opportunity to have a greeting. So I want to, I think that my practice in my life now is more focused on others than it is me. I want to be more selfless as a musician. Yeah. And that's been my focus as of late to be selfless and to be a giver as opposed to a yeah. How about yourself? That actually, is, I'm so glad I asked this because I wouldn't put it in the same words, but it's actually, or I wouldn't even think about it. But the melody thing, yeah. It's like every, when I used to practice when I was younger, it was just like, you know, just exercises. And, and now, even when I practice long tones, I'm practicing a melody, you know, or when I write my own exercise, every exercise is a melody, you know? And, and the same, I, I've been practicing a lot of, um, well, so the melody seems to have changed. And the other thing is just like awareness, you know? Mm. Like why, why am I practicing sound? Like how is my sound on the bottom of the horn in the middle is the same? Do I like it? Is that what I like constantly questioning, you know? Mm -hmm. how it can get better and if it's that what I want and so it's not just about doing long terms it really has a purpose the same when I'm practicing technique I'm practicing time feel and I'm practicing mm -hmm. that I'm very aware of the details like how am I playing each note you know and it's more about like being with the metronome it's about like how am I feeling the tempo you know like what are the things that are unique to me you mm -hmm. know 
Yeah. So I'm sort of embracing that and and um, you know trying to be as musical, like you said, like trying to be as musical as, as I can every time I'm practicing. So I don't look at it as like now long tones and then warm up and then this, but it's rather I'm practicing harmony and practicing ideas. How can I incorporate that into that routine? You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you um, are you always happy with your playing after you when you oh. hear yourself? No. I have, you know, like I, I'm extremely hard on myself and I know like, like it's, it's like a little journal in my head, like Melissa, you don't know this shit really well, like you still haven't, you know, and, and it usually for me has, lately has to do with um, harmony, you know, <clears throat> and I can appreciate my plane and I can be, I can see the good things, but I know it's not that, you know, but the one thing that makes me really frustrated and I, try not to do this because that is when I get the press about my plane is when I'm playing automatic pilot when I know that I'm not thinking I'm like I know this works you know or like I'm playing sort of like just fast notes because I can't play the chain like I know I'm bullshitting you know mm -hmm. and that is something that makes me put me in a weird um in a weird you know mindset when it comes to my plane because I when I was just listening to you play that example I'm like how can I how can you not love what you just played because it was just so creative and it was just so focused and so centered. And yeah. I mean, you had like total control the whole time. It was like, that's how I felt. And I, when I was listening to that, I was like, oh my gosh, I need to yeah. go, I'm going to study harmony with <laughs> Melissa Aldana. That's what I'm going to do. No, I've actually, actually, when it comes to harmony, everything is, is the whole, like it's everything that you know and like everyone does, you know, it's just like, I, I tried to flip it around. You know, mm. and I try like one, if I could think, I, I think about a goal as a musician would be freedom, you know, and sort of like, you know, having the, the harmony or whatever is happening on an unconscious level, subconscious level, and then being able to see the bigger picture, you mm -hmm. know, and how I paint the story on top of that. But yeah, I can hear this and I can, I, you know, I can, I like it, but I know myself very well. So I know like, you know, I know what is, it can be more real and in the mm. moment, you know. What about you? Well, you know, um, I'm never happy with, like when I was just playing that example, like I was like, you know, just like cringing on the inside, like trying to focus on anything other than the trumpet. But <clears throat> to, to go back to the melody, I have just, you know, I know we have to stop in a minute, but I have this interesting story. So Mulgrew Miller was my absolute favorite piano player, right? Yeah. Human being. I love to travel with him. I mean, we did a bunch of duo concerts together, and I'll never remember. I'll never forget this one concert we were doing with with Jimmy Heath, and we were in uh, Switzerland, <clears throat> and it was a master class that Mulgrew was giving. And in this master class, two things were really profound to me. Um, one that that is shocking. I mean, we've all know Mulgrew's playing, but someone says, "So, Mr. Miller, how often do you transcribe?" And he goes. I probably never transcribed an entire solo. So I was just like, whoa, wow. right? So after, after that was said, then um, this piano player says, so Mr. Miller, I'm dying to know your harmonic concept. And, and Mulgrew said, my harmonic concept is melody. And the guy's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand my question. I want to know your harmonic concept. He goes, it's melody, but I just play it in different keys. And I was yeah. like, Oh my gosh, wow. you know, like, like, wow, you know, that was so powerful to me. So, yeah. you know, to kind of, you know, and that's what, that's what you just did, you know, like when you were playing without a song, it was just like, it was great. I mean, I, I was still centered and focused on the melody, but it was kind of like, yeah, you played, the, you know, you, you took it to different places and, but you always brought me back home. So I, I love that. I love it. I mean, that is, that is sunny. Yeah. You know? Yep. And then, so that is the thing is like, how do you explain a student how to practice that? Yeah. And it's not one solo or two, it's like years of like really trying to dig in and then trying to forget and then be like, oh, this is Sonny. Yeah. You know, it's just like the way that he thinks. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, it was great. This has been incredible, Melissa. Yeah. I can't wait to play with you again. Hopefully. No, just it will remember, just remember the two empathy and grace when you hear me. Just don't, you know, don't, 
don't pick up a rock and throw it if I don't sound like I should. Just be Come nice. <laughs> you know. No, I'm looking so looking forward. Same here. And I just want to hop in and uh, thank you both so much. Great, really inspire, inspiring conversation. It was, it was fantastic to have you today. And thanks uh, to those that joined us to, to listen along and go along on this journey. Um, that's all for today. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. And so long. Thank you so much. Thank you, Terrell. Okay. Yeah, really, I needed the inspiration. So thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in a couple of days. See you in a couple of days. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.